Join us this new year for new conversations at the Commonwealth Club. And welcome to today's online event at the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm a journalist and author here in the San Francisco Bay Area, Melissa Kane. And I'm pleased to be joined today by former Republican Congressman and CIA officer Will Hurd. He's been described as, by the Daily Dot as the most interesting man in Congress. I think that's probably true. Hurd is a former clandestine CIA officer and a three-time elected congressman for Texas's 23rd District. Now, his new book is called American Reboot, right here. It's called An Idealist's Guide to Getting Big Things Done. Now, in this book, Heard walks us through some heavy challenges that the nation is facing, including rising income inequality, unprecedented technological change, and dishonest elected officials. He also talks about the Republican Party's ailing vision for the future and challenges to global power. Now, drawing on years of his own personal experience, Heard also gives us a playbook on how to overcome these challenges and how to boldly strive for a new chapter in American history. Now, over the next hour, we're going to be talking about how we got here and we're where we go from here. So if you're watching along with us, please put your questions in that text chat on YouTube and we will get to them later in the program. But for now, without further ado, let us welcome William Hurd. Thank you so much for joining us. Hey, Melissa, it's wonderful to be on. Thanks for having me and I'm looking forward to our conversation today. Thank you so much for making the time. We really appreciate it. And, you know, I read a lot of political books. We do a lot of these for the Commonwealth Club. But I have to say, I would love for you to start off by talking about the story in the introduction to this book, because it just sort of brings you right there and brings in your CIA experience and really tees up why you're writing this book and sort of the urgency you feel in communicating your message today. So maybe you could start us off by regaling the folks at home. And I promise I won't give away the whole book, but at least this story I think is worth, is worth telling. No, I appreciate that, Melissa. And, and the title of, of the first chapter is Get Off the X. And that is actually the second thing you learn at the super, I used to call the super secret CIA training facility called The Farm. Now it's on Google Maps. And, and, the, and the point is, the X is where something's going down. And the last place you want to be where something's going down is where it's going down. So, so move, get out of the way. And, and I use that as a frame for where I think the country is. And, and I tell a story about how it was, it was towards the end of my first tour in, uh, as an undercover officer in the CIA, and I'm doing a surveillance detection route. So my job when I was in the CIA, I started when I was 22 years old, straight out of undergrad. And I had, you know, went through training for two years. And I'm, I'm towards the end of my first year. And you have to do a surveillance detection route before you go meet someone who's giving you secrets. My job was to recruit spies and steal secrets. And part of what you have to do is make sure the local version of the FBI is not following you. And so I'm in a little Toyota Tercel and turned down a, an alley, which I thought was going to be abandoned. When I turned down it, the most people I've ever seen in my life, a couple of thousand people, it was like a parade. There was pack animals. There were five, six people deep on either side. And I'm, I'm in this Toyota Tercel and I'm going about four miles an hour. And this woman walks in front of my car and I roll over her flip-flop, I mash the brakes and I drag her foot across the concrete. Bust her toe wide open, it's bleeding. She looks in the car and realizes I'm not from around there and starts screaming bloody murder. A couple of hundred people are shaking the car, right? They're banging on the car. now. I wasn't going to be able to get off the X at this moment because my little torso wasn't going to be able to get me through all these people. I had a weapon, but not enough ammunition for this situation. So I did what they least expected. I got out of the car and I unfold my six foot three frame out of the vehicle. And I knew some of the local language, but not good enough for this situation. I said, who speaks English? And I remember this little kid for the rest of my life. He kind of swam through the crowd of people, raised a finger and says, I speak the English. 
<laughs> and I said, sir, where's the closest hospital? He got it from the crowd. I said, fetch me a rickshaw, a little scooter with a carriage attached to it. And I made a big display of getting the woman um, money and said, take her. I told this to the rickshaw driver, take her to the hospital immediately. And she gets in the rickshaw. My little translator gets in the rickshaw and they drive away to the airport, uh, to the hospital. And the crowd starts clapping. They're patting me on the back. Some dude even helps shove me back into my car. I'm driving, the sea of people part. I'm driving away and I look in the rear view mirror and everybody's waving at me, right? And my heart is beating because I thought my mother <laughs> was to get a phone call no mother ever wants to get. Now, all uh, the folks in the Commonwealth Club are probably thinking, how the heck is that a, a story about the starting an, an American reboot? But I use that as an example of how where our country is right now, where the people, you know, we're stuck in this car and there's people banging on it. Some political leaders are inciting the people to bang more. Others are ignoring the fact that people are banging. Some people are just, they don't know what to do. And so for me, this is the moment that we're in. We cannot continue on this path that we're on. 72% of Americans think the country is on the wrong track. And that has been a growing number for the last couple of years. And so we don't, we can't continue the way we are. We have to get off the X, do something different. And the whole point for me of writing this book was to say, there's a different way. It's hard. It's hard. Guess what? A lot of people haven't done it. But it's, it, it has to be done, and that's why I wrote um, American Reboot. Uh, you know, it's, yeah, it's just such a jarring story to start out with, and, and it's an interesting metaphor. I think um, for a lot of people who are into politics, it does feel like, uh, you know, people are banging on the sides of the car sometime and kind of, uh, and, and kind of getting really aggressive. Uh, now, you do also talk about your background, and I don't want to jump from there to this, but, but I think your, your personal story is really uh, interesting, it's unique, and certainly informs your current passion to, you know, to reform and to set things right and your sort of moral compass that, that, that you developed as a result of your, of your upbringing. You talk a lot about your parents. I think mm -hmm. the book's dedicated to them. Um, and so I think it would help uh, the audience here to hear a little bit more about where you're coming from and why this is so important. Well, so I'm the baby of three. My, my mom is white, my dad is black. My dad's from East Texas. My mom's from Indiana, and they all and they met in LA in, in the late 60s. And, and then they got married in 1970 and moved to South Texas in 1971 to San Antonio. Now, it was in 1967 that Loving versus the United States was a Supreme Court case that made it legal for an interracial couple to get married, right? In the late 60s, that's crazy. It's, it's hard for so many people to understand that. Now, when my folks moved to San Antonio, it was not in vogue to be an interracial couple. And my, 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 my mom was, was looked, the, my parents live in the home that they live in now, and they lived there for, for 50 years. And because it was the only home at the time that would sell to an interracial couple. My dad was a traveling salesman. And so my mom would be looking at houses during the week and she'd be like, hey, my husband has to come on Friday night or Saturday. They're like, sure, no problem. And my pops would show up and they're like, oh yeah, sorry. The house has been sold, right? And so that's the kind of stuff that they dealt with. My brother, sister and I, we, couldn't, we didn't get the chance to go to the best schools in San Antonio uh, because of this. Now, I, I ended up being fine. And, and even in the 70s, there were still places like my dad when he was traveling as a traveling salesman throughout Texas, couldn't stop. And now, you know, uh, fast forward 30 something years later, their youngest son represented that district, right? Which is, which is, tells us how far, how far we've come. We still got a long way to go. And so my mom had a deal, look, my mom would get sunburned if she walked to the, the, the mailbox during the day, right? And she had these little black kids you know, people would look at her like she was like she was crazy. Um, you know, I, women I dated when I was in high school, they didn't want their daughter uh, dating a, a black guy. Um, it wasn't in vogue to say the world interracial, you know, or biracial when I was coming up. And, and so these experiences helped shape who I am. Now, I also, you know, wore a size 13 shoe when I was in the fifth grade. Uh, my head has been this size since I was four years old. And my last name rhymes with nerd, right? I got, I got picked on a lot. And, <laughs> and, and I was always 
the one person in the room that looked different from everybody else. That taught me empathy, that taught me compassion, and that made, that, that made me to be unafraid to being in, in, in places I had never been before. But I was fortunate to have like uncles, nobody in my parents, either my parents' side thought, you know, them getting married was a good idea, except for Uncle Steve and Uncle Lester. And I didn't know Uncle Steve wasn't my biological uncle, right? It, it was, uh, he was, he was Uncle Lester's um, significant other. And Uncle, Uncle Steve was the one that gave me a computer for the first time, right? So I was, I was, I was lucky to have uh, all this love and amazing people, but also folks that were dealing with these issues, but they never let it change them, right? My dad always taught us have a PMA, a positive mental attitude. That's something that, that I've learned. And so- And your dad so, was a Republican, you also- He, he was, he was. Republicans. Yeah, my dad was a Republican. Uh, Uncle Steve and Uncle Lester were Republicans. <laughs> you know, my, my mom was kind of apolitical. We really didn't, you know, I didn't know that. Like, I didn't know that growing up and as, as a kid. Um, and so, so, but those were kind of the influences that I had in my life. Now, I'm a, you know, I, I decided to study computer science at Texas A&M University, which is near College Station, kind of halfway between Austin and Houston. And um, I was lucky because I, I, I decided to study computer science because I got a internship in high school and worked for this amazing a female engineer who was a Stanford grad and, and ran a robotics program at the Southwest Research Institute. And so, so that made me wanna do computer science. And then I'm at Texas A&M walking across campus. I see a sign that said, take two journalism classes in Mexico City for 425 bucks. I had 450 bucks in my bank account, so I go to Mexico. Fell in love being in another culture. I thought it was cool reading things, seeing things I only read about in books. I had international studies, and that's where I met this CIA tough guy that blew my mind, and I was like, I want to do that, and that kind of began uh, my interest in, in the CIA. So I was fortunate to have, you know, at a young, at a young age, uh, all these experiences. And you tell some great stories in the book. One that I thought was really compelling and important again to, to sort of the purpose of this book is the one about your coach mm -hmm. and heard the nerd, <laughs> which you very, very self-effacingly mm -hmm. just put right in there. <laughs> so, uh, but, but it is an important story to, to how you view yourself and in, in this world. Well, look, uh, Coach Clark was the, the, the coolest dude at Leon Valley Elementary School in San Antonio, Texas. He had played for the Seattle Supersonics. I, I think he was like the 11th or 12th man. It's the first person I'd ever seen dunk a ball, you know, basketball, <laughs> I love basketball, right? Um, and, and, and so he was just the coolest dude. And I cried three times a day. I already talked about why, you know, I was bullied. I, you know, I had big feet, big head. Had, oh, I had a speech impediment until, until I was late in middle school, early high school. And, and, and Coach Clark, I'd probably get in trouble for this now, but Coach Clark call, would call me Heard the, Heard the Nerd. And I hated it. And so one time I, I stopped talking to him. And I, I, I probably did this for like a week. I was, I was, I was hard headed. And he finally says, if Will doesn't speak to me, everybody has to run, right? And so we're in, we're in gym class and I'm probably crying. I'm crying. I know I was crying. You know, I'm wearing jeans. and You probably, cry a lot in this book. I'm just saying, like, you're pretty open about <laughs> and, your and feelings when you were I, little. <laughs> I stand up. I was like, I'm running for everybody. So I'm running in my clothes. You know, this was back before you would have gym clothes. So I'm running in my school clothes and I'm, and I'm out there. He came up to me. He goes, do you know why I tell you, I call you heard the nerd? And I said, because I, I'm pretty sure I didn't curse back then. I probably said, because you're a jerk. And he goes, no, it's because you shouldn't care what other people think about you. You should only care about what the people that are close to you and your family and your loved ones think. And that was a hard lesson for a fourth grader uh, to learn, <laughs> in fourth or fifth grader to learn, but it was a, it was a valuable lesson. And, 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 and that, that is where I started uh, learning to have thick skin, don't respond. You know, when you when people do things to provoke a response, when you don't give them a reason, when I stop crying, people stop picking on me. You know, it changed, and then that that also created me, uh, instilled in me a lifelong hatred of bullies, right? And because now I'm six foot three, two hundred and thirty five pounds, 
you know, I know how to do the the CIA chop, you know, and 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 no one no one messes with me now. And so so, but it was it was a valuable experience that uh, it also taught me about doing the right thing and to be able to deal with the consequences sometimes of doing the right thing. So not only was it a uh, Coach Clark. When I was at Texas A and M, it was uh, there was a horrific tragedy. Uh, we we used to build this huge bonfire. Um, it was a, a hundred year legacy at A and M. It collapsed and killed twelve students. I was student body president at the time, uh, dealing with having to help a a community go through that, uh, but also you know having making decisions that you know people's lives were on the line. And sometimes when you make the right decision, there are negative consequences. And so learning how to deal with those at, at, at you know, even from a young age until um, I was in government was uh, helped make me to be able to represent a 50-50 district, a truly 50-50 district that was 50% Republican, a uh, 50% Democrat. Well, and in the book too, you also talk about um, some votes that you've taken that were uh, not party line votes. Uh, you've also, you know, you sort of come right out in the book and say, look, the, you know, the, the, so the first chapter is get off the X. And the second chapter is about, you know, you, you, the, the Republican Party needs to start looking more like America. And one of the things that it needs to do is, you know, um, get away from some of the conspiracy theory stuff and admit that the January 6th election, I mean, I'm sorry, admit that the 2020 election was not stolen and sort of go from there. So, I mean, you, you seem to be pretty courageous in terms of breaking with some of the more, um, you know, hardline Republican, what may be orthodoxy now. Um, and so how has that, um, how did you feel in those moments? And then how has that impacted it, and how does it continue to impact, you know, you now as a former congressman? Sure. Well, well the, the, the title of the chapter is Don't Be an A-Hole, Don't Be a Misogynist, uh, Don't Be a Homophobe, uh, and, and Don't Be a, 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 all the phobes, right? And, <laughs> yeah, so, yeah it's, uh, it's, it comes right out there. <laughs> so, so to me, look, do the right thing. Right? That's something my, my dad always told me. I, I, one of the stories, <laughs> yeah, we got it. We can, we can uh, blot that yeah. out. For, we'll have to bleep that maybe. <laughs> yeah, we can blot that out for, for viewing audience. Um, so, so, you know, it's another story I tell about how my dad learned a, a story from a gangster in Atlanta before going into jail with Jack Ruby. Y'all will have to read that, read that chapter. Um, but, but do the right thing. And, and so for me, it was none, like none of these decisions were tough. Did I did I have to deal with a, a lot of drama after them? Sure. But as long as I was able to explain what I was doing and why I was doing it, right? That was my that was my I was my goal. And so, you know, I was I actually thought representing a 50-50 district was very empowering because no matter what I did, half the district was ultimately upset with me. And so <laughs> So I told everybody, you're going to see me. It's a big district, 29 counties, two time zones, 820 miles of the border. It took 10 and a half hours to drive from one corner of the district to the other at 80 miles an hour, right, which was the speed limit in most of the district. But I had to find out the hard way it wasn't the speed limit in all of the districts. <laughs> and so, so, so I told people, you're going to see me. You're not always going to agree with me. But you're going to know where I'm coming from and, and why I'm coming from there. And, and so everybody knew what my values were and how I made decisions and, and based them on those values. And so, yeah, there was a number of votes where I may have been the only Republican in Texas or um, only a handful of Republicans across the country in the House that voted for something, but I always explained why I did it. And, and so, and, and people always ask me, did you, were you pressured? by leadership. They knew. They knew when I'm a yes, I'm a yes. When I'm a no, I'm a no. And when I'm an I don't know, you'll find out when I do know, right? And, and so that was, that's the way I always, I, I did it. And I, tr but I tried to be. And I think I was ideologically consistent. Why are we seeing an erosion of trust at all levels of, 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 of society? not just the federal government, not just state governments, not just local governments, not just the media. You're talking about scientific communities, academia. The reason we're seeing an, an, an erosion of trust in all, uh, uh, between the American people and these institutions 
is because of a lack of ideological consistency. You have to be right or you have to be consistent every time. Because when you do it, when you don't, when you're not consistent once, that erodes all that positivity that you that you've built up. And so so I tried that. That's how I, I live my life. That's the way you know, I was taught to be. And I tried to reflect that in, in, in Congress. And and now you ask, how am I handling this now? We got to do something different. We got to get off the X. It's time. Look, uh, this is a, probably a sophisticated group that's watching. It, and, and, and when your computer ain't working, what do you do? You reset it. You reboot the sucker. Right? I learned that when I was working in a computer lab. Let's get back to that fresh operating system. And that, that's the point. And so, so I think there's a number of, of, of generational defining challenges that we're, un, that we're not addressing right now because our politics are getting in the way. And so we have to do things differently. And, and I feel like, you know, I'm going to always, you know, tell the truth as I see it. Well, you know, so I I'm, grew up in a small town right outside of Atlanta, Georgia, and I might, my Southern accent might, <laughs> you might drag my Southern accent right back out of me. But, um, but uh, one of the things that you talk about a lot in the book that I think is so important, and it's something that I know I, I harp on all the time, my husband is so sick of hearing it, but um, that no one talks to real people anymore. You know, I'm, I'm very proud of the fact that I have friends who are, you know, what I would call civilians, right? They're not in the business. They're just regular folks trying to do, you know, trying to get through the day, get their kids to school and, and, and you know, sort of deal with what they have to deal with. And I wonder sometimes if people in the media or even people in office are really actually talking to actual humans who, <laughs> who don't really care about a lot of, you know, the filibuster, not really. You're like, they're just, they just, inflation is something they're, they're going to care about, but, you know, not necessarily certain uh, things that, that people, you know, like you or I might, you know, get all, you know, worked up about. And so you do talk about, your 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 approach and how you got elected in a in a in a split district and that really involves talking to regular people and and getting outside your own bubble 100 percent, melissa and, and and so let me let me get into some math here elected people are talking to the wrong folks and here's why our system is designed for that so let's take the last non-presidential election 2018 the number of contested House seats, and when I say contested, I mean in the previous presidential election, the population voted for a one party of president for president and the opposite party for the House member, okay? There was only 34 of those seats in 2018 out of 435. That means that 92% of congressional seats, House seats, were decided in a primary. And the average number of people that voted in a contested primary in 2018, 54,000 people. That means 26,501 people decided on average, 92% of the members of the house. That means two to 4% of the population decided at who was going. And those are some of the craziest people. Those are the, those are the extremes. And so, so because, and, and now, so, so that was 2018. If we, at 34, if we go back to, to 2000, that number was north of 70. I have, I have all these numbers in the book. In 1980, the number was north of 150. So you think and, and, and there's, this, there's been this fallacy that the only way, like that the last 30 years, that you have to have one party rule to get anything done. It's actually the worst way to govern. And, and what do I mean by that? Every piece of legislation we know by name, Civil Rights Act of 64, Voting Rights Act of 65, Every Student Succeeds Act, First Step Act, um, the, the Clean Water Act, the Americans with Disability Act, I can go on. All of those were passed with one pa party in power in the House, one party of power in the Senate. But it's only over the last 30 years that we think one party rule is the best way to do things. That's absolutely wrong. Our system is designed for that, right? Now, if I had a magic wand, I would say no seat can be more than plus six in either direction, meaning no seat can, and, and this, is, this is 
uh, House seats. This is state rep, state senate, city council, you name it. That means plus six means no seat can be more than 56% Democrat or 56%. I'm not sure that's mathematically possible in California, but okay. <laughs> sure, sure. But, 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 but my point is, I don't have a magic wand. Yeah. So what do we need? We need more people that vote in general elections to start participating in the primaries. When I ran, I, I because mine was a seat that went back and forth every cycle for a decade, my seat was decided by 250,000 plus people, not 54,000 people. And so that is, that is ultimately the big difference of how we need to change things. Oh, and by the way, we need people that are running for office that are willing to inspire rather than fear monger. I would- well, well, I mean, I mean, so again, you, 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 you say some things in the book that are, and we're gonna get to that in just a second, that are they're a little, you know, sort of off of the Republican orthodoxy is, is part of the, because. Let me back up. I think part of the reason why people don't participate in primaries is either they, you know, maybe they don't care, maybe they don't feel engaged. But I mean, there are a lot of independents, depending on where you live, you may not be able to even participate in the primary if you're not registered with one party or another. Do we need more parties? Are there, I'll go ahead and admit I'm a sucker for an independent. So uh, I love it like Ross Perot and, you know, but, um, but is it, is part of it that the parties themselves are not capturing the, um, you know, the hearts and minds of, of big spots of people. And so the people don't feel like they want to engage in what is essentially a primary, which is essentially a party function. Um, and is that part of the problem as somebody who may, you know, be on the, you know, in disagreement with other Republicans on a lot of things? Have you thought about a, a third party? Do you think that might be part of what is missing in terms of getting voters engaged? Sure. So, so that that the your 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 analysis is right on. There is a nobody cares, right? Pete, there's they're not being inspired by what either side is putting out. Now, could a third party win in the United States? Yes, it'd be really hard. It's a logistical. It's a it's a logistical. Um, um, uh, um, it's, it's difficult logistically to get on the ballots everywhere, depending on what level you're talking about. Um, but I think. So, so I, I, I could say that there is a way that someone could win similar to way um, um, AMLO, um, um, Lopez Obrador, President Lopez Obrador in Mexico won, or Macron won in France. I think that is, I think that is a way. Now, I don't know if long term a third party actually achieves what I think needs to be done, and that is, that, that is encouraging working together to solve problems, not bomb throwing. Because if I can make an argument that the UK system is the Israeli system, that if we went to that, you're actually going to, a, a third party becomes the largest party, but they can never have a super majority. And so you always are going to have to agree in advance to get anything done with one of the more extreme parties. So the extreme party actually gets more things done. So, but, but, but that, this is a, this is a philosophical conversation that, that I um, that that like that, that I think needs to be had. Well, I'm just curious Whatever. if you're you know if you've been approached or you know I know like so in California for example there have been proposals or sort of whispers about maybe starting what what you would call maybe a California Republican Party, sure. which is a little more socially liberal to you know to be able to attract some more attention out here among fiscal conservatives who don't want to trade their socially liberal values. And so there's always this, um, you know, this sort of conversation about, about are the parties really capturing, um, you know, sort of everybody? And, uh, and do you find yourself thinking maybe I should just start a new party because my party is just so far gone? Um, or maybe some people in my party need to start their own party <laughs> um, and get out of my party um, just because you, because you do tend to think outside the box. So, so, I, so um, I personally have made the decision to stay and fight, right? I, I, our system right now is a two-party system. If other people work on this problem, then I, I don't think it is, it is insignificant um, uh, or wasteful effort. Um, but I think, you know, the, the 22 election, the 2022 election is going to be decided, it's going to be two parties, right? Um, the 2024 election is likely to be decided by two parties. And so, so I think it's important to, to stay and fight and to have a competition of ideas between the Republicans and the Democrats. And because, look, people want to say, oh, where, you, you know, uh, the, the Democrats have problems that they got to address as well, too. 
And, and, and so, so, but we need to have this competition of ideas and a system. If, if I had to prioritize one thing, it is to force people to solve problems. I was rewarded when I was in Congress for solving problems because if every Republican voted for me, I would still lose. I had to get independents. I had to get Democrats. So I am influenced by my own experiences, right? And so that's why I think I try to do this and, and, and ultimately trying to make the party because here's the other thing I found. We, now I, I'm, I'm not negating um, what I would call the authoritarian wing of the Republican Party. I think calling it the Trump wing is too narrow. Um, I think authoritarian is broader. And, and while that, ha there is a, it's not a majority. It is a loud group. It's an influential group. And if, if Republicans win in 20, if take the House back in 2022, which most prognosticators think is going to happen, that wing is going to have an, uh, an outsized influence in how the party operates. But that's also what's going to lead to losses in 2024. Uh, we go swing back every two years. And so, so, but here's what I've learned. Voters, people that voted for me, that believed in the Republican Party, they, you know, they are part of the party as well, too. And it's about inspiring them. And you made a point. Texas just went through elections, uh, primary elections. Three million people voted about a uh, um, little bit more Republicans and Democrats, but that's 3 million Republicans and Democrats. Out of 30 million, 27 million people were basically like, this is not worth my time because neither side is providing something that is worth me to engage or focus on. The best argument, the, the best, the best, um, 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 comment I've gotten so far since the book is one of my best friends I've known forever text me. He goes, will you explain to me why I have to vote in primaries all the time? And, 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 and I, I tell, I think I tell the story in the book. The first time I went to South by Southwest, the, the tech, con you know, it's a, it's a music conference, a, um, movie conference and a tech conference in, in Austin, Texas. Um, I was on a panel with a bunch of YouTube stars. Four of them combined had 1 billion subscribers on YouTube. I had 60 at the time, right? And probably 10 of them are on this call. And, and so, so the, one of the, the, the young uh, women were, was uh, the digital director for The Rock, Dwayne Johnson. Mm. And the movie Moana was about to come out. And she goes, if Moana fails at the box office, are we going to blame the consumer, the moviegoer, or are we going to blame the product, the people that made the movie? Now, I find, I think Moana was a delightful movie, and I think it was successful at the, at the box office. But she added, it's only in politics do you blame the consumer, the voter, instead of the product, the politicians, the people running for office, right? So the opportunity, in my opinion, is someone who looks to talk to those other people, to begin with your question, Melissa, to talk to people of the things they care about. They care about putting food on the table, a roof over their head, and making sure the people they love are healthy, happy, and safe. That's what they care about. Because I was in, and, and, and I'll tell a quick story, uh, Melissa, but I'm, I'm going on long on this answer, I apologize. Okay. The, so because, so nobody thought a black Republican could win in a 71% Latino district, okay? And nobody thought I had a chance. And then when I won, nobody thought there was no way in heck this dude's going to win re-election. So people were always heralding my demise, right? And I held the record for the most town halls when I was in Congress. This was at a time when Democrats were keeping track and they were saying Republicans aren't doing town halls. And they did, a, they did a website that tallied. I was always on the top. They actually ultimately took down the website because they were, they were pissed that a Republican was always on top and by a mile, right? And so, so the national media would always want to come up with me on these trips. I would call them DC to DQs. Y'all got Dairy Queens in, in California, right? Yeah. I'm not sure, but I definitely remember Georgia, growing up in Georgia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. After so, the softball game on the weekends, you all go to Dairy Queen. Yeah. Dairy Queen, it's a place you go to get a cool treat on a hot day, right? You could get burgers and all this kind of stuff. And in Texas, you got at least one in every county. And so I would do 35 town halls in five days, and I would do them all at Dairy Queens. 
And, and I did this every summer and, and the national media would want to come and, and because they thought I was a bellwether for the rest of the country. And I told him, I said, listen, you're, I'm going to do my thing. And I'm going to give you 10 minutes at the end and do whatever you want. And so all these national reporters, I, I would talk, I would take Q&A, and then the reporters would be like, I don't understand, to the, to, the, to the participants in the town hall. I don't understand. You didn't ask about this. You didn't ask about this. You didn't ask about this. And they would run through a list of whatever was trending on Twitter that day or whatever cable news was talking about. And all of them were like, because we don't care, right? We care about, our, the ro- why are the roads crummy? Uh, why am I a veteran? It's hard for me to get uh, health care. Uh, why does my school not teach computer science? Right? Like these were the issues. Why are we seeing? Um, why is government spending impacting my ability to buy groceries at the store because it's impacting inflation? Right? Like these were the things people care about. And and so so oftentimes we have these debates around whatever is whatever is is trending, and that's not reflective of where most Americans are. And I saw that in my own district. I've seen that across the country. And that is ultimately the problem. And whoever figures out how to appeal, and it's hard. What I'm talking about is a, it's hard because the professional political class want to run the same race in every single congressional district. And that's the difference. And that's what we need to break. You know, that's you just hit on like one of my biggest bugaboos is the fact that there's a numbers issue, right? There's 350 million people in America, give or take, right? And so even if somebody, even if a million people are talking about it on Twitter, that is such a tiny, 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 tiny percentage of the actual public, um, of the actual voting public even. I mean, it just, it seems our, our brains are maybe just not wired to, to really, to say, even though this looks like a lot, it really isn't. Um, and it really does take, I think, you know, getting out there and really just talking to people to sort of get that reality check, to say even a ton of people uh, on social media doesn't really amount to much in the in in the grand scheme of things, uh, but I do want to get to some of your policy proposals. And um, one of the ones I thought was so interesting because yeah, in California we talk a lot about um, gay, you know gay marriage was a big issue for a while. Uh, I mean you know obviously still something that's important, but you know has been relatively resolved. But uh, you know when you talk about family values and how the Republican Party can really um, you know talk about family values in a way that really is more inclusive and actually sort of gives them an opening. I mean, we saw in the Virginia governor's race, I mean, right now with, you know, what has happened with the pandemic, there's a big opening for Republicans to try and stake a claim when it comes to education and childcare and families. And, you know, you have some interesting ideas about how that can, uh, that can happen. Look, historically, when we've talked about new, about family values, we talk about uh, issues of abortion, of Second Amendment, of, of gay marriage, right? Now, now the gay marriage issue, this is this has been resolved. Um, you know, I'm I'm glad again, I'm I'm because my my uncles, Uncle Steve and Uncle Lester would not have been did not were not able to get married when they were in. We shouldn't discriminate against anybody and, and we shouldn't tell people who they can who they can marry. Um, and, and the issue of, of, of abortion, look, I, I am pro-life, but this is this is a this is one of those issues where you know not too many people change their opinions on on this particular topic but we need to be talking about new family values and that's educating our kids taking care of our family and taking care of our parents you know i'm i am i am learning that a lot of folks are in a similar situation i'm in my dad's 89 and my mom's 77 my mom has dementia and, and dealing with elder care issues. And how do you do things to make sure that they could have an enriching and quality life? You know, they took care of us when we were snot-nosed punk kids. You know, it's our turn to take care of our, our families. And then how are we preparing our kids for jobs that don't exist today? This is a real opportunity in which we have. And so, so for me, we should be the party of education. And, you know, look, I'm a proud product of public schools. I love public Same. schools, right? Um, but school choice has been good in Texas. There's been a 20-year longitudinal study um, where black and brown kids that were in, that were in um, uh, uh, charter schools eliminated the achievement gap uh, with their white counterparts. 
this should be heralded in 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 uh, uh, around the country but i also think we should be giving public schools the same freedom and flexibility that if you have one high school in a school district should be able to do things a little bit different than another high school in that same in that same school district and so this is this is an actual opportunity for us um, we should be making sure that, um, you know, we continue to empower people rather than empowering the government. I, I think that's at the core of this notion of, of new family values and where our opportunity lies. And, and here is going to be that we have an opportunity. The Republican Party has an opportunity. When I, my last year in Congress, I was the only Black Republican in the House. There's two now, potentially going to be five in this next, in this next Congress. The, 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 the number of Latinos in uh, Republicans is, is increasing to year over year. You're probably gonna see a um, near record, if not record turnout of Latinos for Republicans in the 22 election. We have an opportunity, but that's only if we recognize. We're not winning because the country's like, we love you. They're winning because we really don't like what the other people are doing. And if we don't recognize that, then we're going to make the mistakes and not focus on the things that people actually care about. And we are, we're going to lose um, in 2024. And that pendulum is going to swing uh, one more time. And so I, I think that is where the real opportunity is. And what's even more important, we have income inequality because we have education inequality. And so making sure more people have that ability to, 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 to learn. And some of us take it as a fait accompli. Many people on this call uh, probably, you know, don't think about this on a daily basis because you have access to some of the best schools. But we saw this in the pandemic, the kids that didn't have access to, to high-speed internet. Uh, we all know that the map that, um, that was done about access to high-speed internet, it's terrible. It's more like um, there was a, a study done, the, the um, I'm forgetting which, which, which government entity uh, did the review, but I think Microsoft did one that was a little bit closer to found out about probably a hundred million people don't have access to high-speed internet. That's crazy, like almost a third of the country. So let's play this out. So, so you know, I, I talk about this in the book quite significantly about the digital divide. Oftentimes when we talk about the digital divide, we talk about access to devices. But, and, and, or maybe we may talk about access to infrastructure. But there's a third piece, access to figure out how to use the device and infrastructure. And if you don't have all three, and we saw that in a lot of communities um, after, after, at, during the pandemic, and then when things are moving so fast, where AI is going to be, you know, uh, artificial general intelligence. I'm on the board of a company that's going to that. We're going to get there sooner than folks think. Uh, we're going to achieve quantum supremacy a lot sooner than, than folks think. We'll, we'll get to that. But if you do not, if those are going to be things and you can't access them, you're screwed. And so, so those are, these are some of the conversations because we, because ultimately we got to make sure our kids are ready to compete with kids that are being subsidized and, and taught by the Chinese government, right? And, and all of this is about a, a new Cold War between the United States and the Chinese government. And, and make it clear, and I'll end with this, M Melissa, it's, it's the Chinese government. It's not China. It's not the Chinese people. It's not, it's not, it's definitely not Chinese Americans, right? The Asian American, our Asian American brothers and sisters that have been dealing with hate crimes for the last couple of years is just unacceptable, right? But it's very clear it's the, it's, the, it's the Chinese government, and we can probably get into that a little bit later. There, I definitely wanted to talk about that, about the Ukrainian invasion and how that's playing out. In addition, I do want to come back to this whole uh, quantum um, <laughs> issue because that is incredibly frightening. Like that just it was just amazing to read about. But we do have a couple audience questions that you want to get to. So, um, and I, I think I know the answer to this one, but I'd love to hear uh, more about your take on it. Uh, this is uh, this question says, in your opinion, how much of a problem does money play when it comes to American politics? It seems like you know when we talk about you know people just just, you know, staying inside their bubble and not doing more town halls. It's because they're, they're being told like it's a waste of money to send campaign material to spend and you know, again, resources to, to go talk to these other people that sort of the, the need to target money uh, kind of keeps, you know, the fringe, uh, you know, voters 
alive and you know the favorites of of the campaign consultants but but i'd love to hear more about what your 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 take on is about money and politics generally so my dad retired after 30 years of working for a notions company most people don't know what that word is it's zippers buttons threads stuff like that he sold that to to stores and then when he retired from that, him and my mom started a beauty supply business. So they sold shampoo and conditioners and relaxers to salons around San Antonio. And I say that my parents were not wealthy. I was, you know, before I ran for office, my only job as a, you know, at a university was to work for the CIA, you know. And so I was able to put a little away to buy a home in, in San Antonio, which I still live in now. And, and so I, I say, say I wasn't wealthy. But I was able to raise money in order to get my message out. And I was able to raise enough money to counter self-funders. So my first two opponents, and when I ran, when I won in 09 but lost in a runoff in the in the by 700 votes, he was he was independently wealthy, put his own money in the campaign. In 2014, when I finally came, won, and again, same problem in the in the in the, in the in the primary. So I was able to counteract. And, and my ability to raise money. Now, these outside groups, it is rare for one outside group to be in a race and another outside group that's opposite to not be in the race. So ultimately, a lot of this money is a push. And who benefits? The professional political class, the people that run races, pollsters, all that, and media buyers. My number one expense, number one expense still to this day, is ads on television right? Digital ads are growing, but this is where the bulk of that money is. My general consultant, which is in essence, the senior person that kind of runs these campaigns, was a multimillionaire, and my chief of staff had a difficult time buying a home in Washington, D.C. That's unacceptable. Now, one area that where I think we should all agree is all money, you should know where it's coming from. Know exactly who's providing it, right? And, and, I, and I think that's something that we can start with to know, right, where this is. Oh, and by the way, right, like, so of all of my races, I think my, 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 my campaign manager told it up, close to north of $70 million was spent in all my races, that's both sides. That, that's, a lot of, that's a lot of money for a congressional seat. Um, and that was, it was consultants that are making most of the money. So, so yes, I, I, I think at a minimum, we should, we should know, I like this notion of dark money where you don't know who the funder is. I think that needs to, that needs to change. Uh, we have another question here. Um, are you familiar with the For the People Act, the Election Reform Act? No. Okay. Um, all right. Well, then I will move on if that person wants to ask an additional question about election reform. But uh, this person asked, um, are there any current elected officials that you admire right now? My husband and I were just having this conversation about, like, who are your heroes? And it's like, I can't even think of any that are currently in office like uh you know how, isn't that difficult these days well so I've, so my when i look in the house my, my homie is john catco he's a he's a republican from new york state he's the ranking member of the house homeland security committee and then a democrat a uh, pete aguilar they're in california he's from um uh san bernardino right that's near la right um yeah. sorry my my i need to improve my california my california Generally, it's fine. <laughs> um, so 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 pete and i um were we we worked we worked closely together on on things it, and what's what was fascinating about that relationship it's easy working with people that you agree mostly on right pete and i had some very different agreements on things but we were able because because we trusted each other we knew the others were coming you know, from, a, from a place of, of one, being knowledgeable, but two, wanting to actually solve a problem. We were able to put together the only bipartisan immigration um, a bill that, 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 that paired border security with the DACA fix and solving some of the root causes um, in places like the Northern Triangle. And so, so those, are, those, are, those are folks that I really like. Um, you know, uh, Charlie Baker and um, and Larry Hogan, governors that people awful to often talk about. Um, I don't know. I I, I, I should. I, I needed research better. A good California governor. Um, I think the new Democratic mayor of New York is doing some interesting things, um, and he's he's breaking the molds. 
um, as well. And so, and, he, and he's sticking to that, even though he's, he's catching heat for some of his, for some of his early decisions. Um, so I, I think those are, those are, those are, are some of the, some of the examples. Excellent. All right. We have another question here. Somebody writes, your old district, um, the Texas 23rd, uh, shifted to the right in 2020. What do you think happened? Well, it shifted to the right because some tall, dark, and handsome member of Congress spent a lot of time in, in areas um, getting people to feel like it's okay to vote for a Republican and that the sky you know is you know, the, yeah, um, the skies weren't going to open and a lightning bolt wasn't going to hit them. Right. Uh, but 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 there was other two issues in the 2020 election that was driving this. And and, and broadly, here's I would say the two lessons from 2020. Don't be a jerk and don't be a socialist. Um, there, This is and, and, and the fact that the fact that Joe Biden won. And I've made it very clear. Joe Biden won. Joe Biden won because Donald Trump was incapable of growing the GOP into new voters. However, Joe Biden had zero coattails. So yes, the Democrats retained the House and, and took the, they took the Senate. I, the Senate is an asterisk. So 50-50 is not a, something, to, something to, to, to get excited about. But they lost a number of House seats when they were expected to gain. And that was, that's the notion, don't be a socialist. And, and, and sometimes that phrase socialist gets thrown around. I go deep into what it actually means about concentration of, of, of factors of production into the hands of either the workers or these collectives that drive this, right? There, there is, so, 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 you know, I, I get deep into to what that actually means. And that's what the American public told us in 2020. But what do we do? Republicans became bigger jerks. And Democrats became bigger socialists, right? And that's a problem. However, within that, within that issue, in South and West Texas, which I represent, there were two issues that dealt with people's livelihoods, the border and energy. The defund the police initiative. And when a good majority of the Democratic Party was sitting as being behind um, uh, uh, defund the police, which was so bad that the State of the Union, the president had to say, we should actually be funding the police, right? The 40% of, of Latinos along the border are, are connected to law enforcement in some form or fashion. And then alternatively, another 40% are dealing with um, energy sector. So when you're seen as anti-energy, and I, look, I'm, I'm of, the, of the opinion we need an all above energy strategy in order to uh, get to net zero, in order to deal with, with climate change. Uh, but these two issues is what changed people's, uh, increased people's voting, increased people's voting behavior. That was one of the trends um, that was happening in, in, in 2020. Interesting. And, you know, we see, I, we had another question from the audience about Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. Uh, and, and I think generally the idea that he, in addition to some other high profile Republicans, are sort of fighting this CRT thing. There's the, you know, so-called don't say gay bill. I mean, you know, the, the, as you talk about sort of how the Republicans could sort of diffuse some of these culture wars, um, what do you make of folks who are trying to maybe uh, the person said um, refighting those you know certain culture wars is that um, ultimately helpful? Or are you guys trying to you know do you think the party's trying to reframe it? What do you what's your take on that? So so th this is an like we always want to frame issues as or issues. Mm -hmm. It's A or it's B, right? When most of the times it's an and issue. And so, so slavery happened, Jim Crow happened. It impacted our communities. It impacted black and brown communities. My parent, I couldn't go to the best schools in San Antonio, Texas because of these things, right? These things are real. And most people and most Republicans agree with that. But the way you teach it, is not to take some fifth graders and separate them by the color of their eyes or the color of their hair, right? And, and those are, and, 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 and I would probably say many of those things are the outliers, but they're happening enough 
that is causing some of, some of this debate. So again, we can talk about these things in a way that makes sense. And that's where the opportunity is to go beyond and say, it, you know, these are all things that we should know. And why should we know them? So that we don't repeat them, right? So that we understand these, these cultural influences on folks and that we can get beyond them. That's why it's important to teach them, right? And so, so but thinking that the majority of Republicans don't believe that racism is real. I, th that's not, that's, that's, that's actually an incorrect statement because when you look at actual voters, that's, that's not the case. So, so I, I think, um, yes, the way you should address these issues is to inspire not fear monger, right? I don't think we should be talking about sex education with elementary schools in the first place, right? Uh, but, but you can also do that and not discriminate against the LGBTQ community, right? Like, like this is, a, we can do both. We can do both, right? And, and that's where I think when you have people that are talking about in these complicated issues that are tricky, but be thoughtful, be honest about them, um, th that's where the opportunity is, right? And, 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 and oftentimes I'm talking about where the GOP should be, right? The, you know, some of the people that are in the party, the loudest voice is one that gets some of the most attention are not that way. But what I want, my experiences are based off of the people that I represent, the people that I see and the Republicans I talk across the country. Yeah, I totally agree. I think, you know, when you talk to normal people, though, you know, everyone gets that things are complicated. And I always wonder, like, you know, you sit down at Thanksgiving dinner, there are people around you, you love that you would take a bullet for, but you also hate them and you also <laughs> don't understand them and you also just wish they would do one thing differently and you can do you can hold both things at the same time and think two things at the same time and feel these conflicting things multiple things that seem conflicting but aren't about people in your life and I always just I always ask my husband I'm like do these people not have Thanksgiving dinner like <laughs> like you can be it can be complicated it's okay people sure, and Melissa, I, I always tell people too I'm like do you agree with your spouse or your best friend 100% of the time? Absolutely not. So, so why do we expect that sometimes from our elected officials? However, it's our elected officials' responsibility to, be, to do that ideological consistency like I talk about, to make sure that their audio and their video match, right? The things that they're saying are being reflected in the things that they're doing. Like the, this is the kind of, uh, of thing that I think we need to see. All right, we have time for one last question and I hope I don't get in trouble for asking this, but I'm gonna ask because I have to. Now, this is, right now you are working as a consultant for a company. Um, well, actually, I think you're on the board of, 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 another, of another company on security issues, given your CIA background. You're, yet yeah, you've written this book. Uh, are you running for something or this is not the actions of a man uh, happy with his day job. So what's the plan here? Are you, uh, are you aiming for a higher office or a different office or running for Congress again? Well, if my colleagues are watching, I am happy with my day job. Um, and Sorry, I didn't mean to get you in trouble. Enjoying, look, look I, <laughs> so, so I've been fortunate to serve my country in a number of different ways. And if the opportunity comes to serve my country again, I'll evaluate it, right? But thinking beyond the current election to me is a fool's errand because you, you, know, you gotta think about right now, I'm not on the ballot. In, in 2022, uh, the way I thought I could serve is by taking some of these experiences that I learned in dangerous places in the CIA or in the halls of Congress or in the boardrooms of international businesses and apply them to how we can get off the X right now. And so I felt like that was a service. And then again, if the opportunity comes to run, I'll think about it because it's too important. And, and, and the, the, the reality is this, we call this thing America an experiment for a reason, because it was. Nobody thought in the world at the time that we were gonna survive. And it wasn't another 60 years until we had another democracy in the world, and that was Switzerland. There are only 14 countries that have been a democracy for more than 100 years. Democracy is fragile, but this has led to 247 years of trying to achieve a more perfect union that has led to an economy that has been the, and, and, and a quality of life that has been the envy of the world. 
and it has also allowed us to uplift humanity. I wanna see that continue for another 247 years. And, and that's why I put some of these ideas um, down on paper to say, hey, this, we, don't have to, we don't have to accept the way things are right now. We can do something different, but it's gonna be hard. Well, you know, I wish we had four more hours and a bottle of wine because there's so much to talk about here. The book is called uh, American Reboot. I also I feel like an honorary CIA member. Like you learn a lot about cool CIA stuff in here too. Just just side note. Uh, anyway, so many thanks to Will Hurd. He is the author of this new book, American Reboot. Thank you so much for joining us today. We also want to thank our audience and watching who are watching and participating with us live. Now, if you want to watch more programs with the Commonwealth Club, just visit commonwealthclub.org slash events. You can also donate there. I'm Melissa Kane. Thank you everyone for joining us and stay safe.